This is a lecture on uh, the uh, refraction microtremor technique, and uh, it's a, uh, a simple and uh, new way of surveying for um, not P wave velocities like we talked about for looking for um, uh, using the, the seismic refraction technique in general, uh, but for S wave velocities. And uh, I call it refraction microtremor because it uses um, the exact same kind of equipment that we use for uh, surveying for uh, uh, surveying for uh, P wave velocities. Uh, vertical geophones spread out a, along a line at equal spacing between 12 and 24 channels usually. Um, and here in this video, you can see a uh, uh, a student employee of mine uh, back in 2003 uh, along uh, Interstate 15 in Las Vegas putting out uh, one of the sensors and uh, instead of using a cable to connect all the sensors we had the sensors set uh, 20 meters apart and uh, and put um, uh, attached to uh, independent recorders which is what's in the silver bag that, uh, that he's laying down next to the to the sensor on the right, you can see uh, one of these uh, one of these sensors, um, <clears throat> and uh, it's stuck into a uh, a crack in in the pavement, uh, also in Las Vegas. And here's the silver bag which uh, carries the uh, uh, the recorder for just that one sensor. Now, uh, in this presentation, um, you may see, especially in the downloadable materials. You may see uh, websites uh, which are at seismo.unr.edu, and some of them say uh, uh, might still say www.seismo.unr.edu, and then something after that to uh, locate it uh, uh, exactly. And just be aware that um, the uh, the website is now uh, crack, c r a c k dot seismo.unr.edu. And with the same things uh, exactly at the end. Um, so if you see a, uh, a www.seismo link, just change it to uh, crack.seismo, and uh, you'll uh, you'll get to the information that I intended. All right. Now um, there are many different ways of measuring shear velocities, uh, and this table compares them. Um, refraction microtremor is the uh, the newest one, perhaps. Um, there are it, it arose out of uh, uh, some of the other techniques, uh, principally out of the uh, the microtremor array, and out of the uh, the crosshole uh, crosshole seismic, and um, the uh, um, uh, the several different methods are are given here um, according to their uh, uh, their name and also by their ASTM um, procedure number. So, uh, for instance, uh, regular uh, seismic refraction, um, uh, regular seismic refraction surveys for P wave velocity uh, can be done uh, according to a uh, standard procedure called ASTM D5777, and that is a uh, uh, allows you as a as a contractor uh, perhaps doing those surveys a way to um, uh, to exactly specify to your client uh, what you're going to give them you you just you simply say that you'll perform the survey according to ASTM D5777 and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, uncertainties in the client's mind a lot of the uncertainties in your mind are all set um, and and that's uh, uh, a very good way to uh, to do things, and one of the reasons why uh, people are are willing to pay uh, to get copies of these ASTM standards. I have all the standards, uh, at least that apply to soils and rock, in my office. Uh, they get updated uh, uh, yearly, uh, at least the full set. Um, there's a recent update to uh, the uh, uh, P wave seismic refraction um, technique, and. Um, but here I'm saying that uh, D5777 um, applies also to shear waves, uh, although the standard itself uh, says nothing about shear wave uh, surveying. So you have to 
uh, basically uh, uh, you know make changes to the procedure uh, to do that. There is only one um, standard method for getting shear wave velocity, and that's uh, called cross hole seismic uh, D forty four twenty eight. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, easy to make into a standard because it's quite accurate. You know, maybe three percent accuracy for the velocity that you uh, that you determine. But the cost per measurement is high, at least fifteen thousand dollars. Why is it so high? Because you have to have three boreholes, okay, and you have to have a source of seismic energy, and you can only do it at uh, effectively at sites that are relatively quiet. So it's not very effective in an urban area. And it looks down maybe to uh, to thirty meters. So cross hole seismic is actually uh, not applied very often for determining uh, uh, shear wave velocities. It's too it's too uh, expensive. Now, why would anybody want to know a shear wave velocity? Uh, well, there are many reasons, um, but the principal reason is that the International Building Code, since I think uh, nineteen ninety seven, um, has specified that um, every building site and every building permit uh, requires an assessment of shear wave velocity. Why? For uh, uh, not just for foundation design issues, but really for seismic design issues. Uh, no matter where in the world, whether it's it doesn't matter whether it's in a uh, seismically uh, quiet area that never gets earthquakes, uh, you know, at least relative to human history, or a very actively uh, seismic area. Uh, like California or Japan, uh, that uh, is constantly getting earthquakes. Um, the uh, the cross hole, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, the shear wave velocity is necessary to get uh, uh, the seismic rating of the uh, of the building site, and then the design of the building proceeds uh, given um, you know how strongly the the shaking is is expected to affect the building. Um, you know, once the uh, seismic site class is determined, so this gives builders everywhere in the world a reason to want to determine shallow shear wave velocity. Uh, the building code specifies that uh, um, uh, the international building code specifies that we should have the shear wave velocity uh, on average down to um, a depth of thirty meters at uh, each building site, and um, so that's why there's this array of different techniques uh, that are capable of, of measuring shear wave velocity. And you can see that uh, you know, one problem with uh, refraction, as you, as you uh, have seen and will see in the uh, refraction lab, um, that the velocities and the depths of the different uh, refractors are not easy to determine. Okay? And, um, so your uh, your error ends up being uh, larger, about twenty uh, percent. Okay, um, the it, uh, refraction survey is is fairly costly to conduct commercially, uh, not as bad as uh, cross hole. Uh, you can get deeper, but uh, that's only at quiet sites. You need an active source. Um, you don't need a drill hole, which is a huge advantage. The advantages are in yellow. The disadvantages are in red. Um, and uh, but you're going to have relatively poor resolution, uh, especially compared to cross hole with its 1.5 meter resolution, or uh, uh, downhole shear wave uh, uh, surveys, uh, which uh, end up with 5% uh, accuracy for 30 meter velocity, and uh, have uh, one to three meters resolution, or the shear wave logger, and and here's the ASTM standard 5753 for um, you know downhole geophysical logging. Uh, again, um, that 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 standard does not describe shear wave velocity logging. Um, you know, relatively expensive, uh, but fine resolution. Okay, so um, there's a problem with the uh, um, uh, with the building code in that uh, you need some kind of um, uh, you need some kind of technique that's that's capable of of determining uh, shear wave velocity at every single building site. Uh, the building code does give you an out. Okay, you can you can default to a sort of medium hazardous uh, um, uh, soil type, uh, seismic soil type, and uh, you know that's even for a uh, you know a standard house uh, which they were building you know twenty twenty thousand a year in Las Vegas uh, um, five years ago, uh, ten years ago. 
you know, even for a standard house, that adds like a thousand dollars in uh, in steel uh, that you have to use to reinforce it to that to that level. If you have to accept that uh, um, uh, that higher class, so you know, it, it's it's well worth doing all these techniques for. Uh, you know, million dollar, ten million dollar, billion dollar buildings. Uh, you want to do everything you can, and uh, find that sweet spot uh, where you have to design it. But for the average house, it just wasn't worth it. Um, and so uh, homeowners were left with uh, with higher costs, higher building costs, um, and uh, and no way. Uh, you know, those those costs were were higher than were. I'm sorry, were uh, the costs that homeowners had to absorb were lower. Than the cost of, the, of assessing the site. Now there is uh, one other uh, technique which is uh, uh, relatively cheap. Uh, for five hundred dollars, it's possible uh, in some circumstances to get a uh, cone penetrometer um, or seismic cone penetrometer uh, uh, result uh, for uh, shear wave velocity. Uh, that's accurate to only twenty percent. You can only get it to uh, maybe fifteen meters at the deepest, usually five meters. And it only works. You can only use a cone penetrometer on a soft site. So, for instance, in Las Vegas and Reno, where we have alluvium near the surface and not um, not mud, uh, you know, the cone penetrometer is entirely impractical. Okay, then we get to the uh, uh, the geophysical uh, shear wave, uh, other geophysical shear wave assessment techniques, still quite expensive um, and requiring sources. Um, uh, or uh, uh, you know, or or not very uh, accurate and, and with relatively poor resolution. All right, so the refraction microtremor uh, technique uh, became very popular about ten years ago in the uh, construction and uh, uh, civil engineering industry um, because um, it uh, uh, it has you know not not terrific accuracy in terms of the. Uh, uh, the 30 meter uh, shear wave velocity assessment, uh, 15%, but that was good enough to uh, to get the code, uh, um, the uh, seismic site class at a, at a site. It only cost $500, so you could actually do the assessment and still save some money. Uh, if it turned out, uh, I mean, it might turn out, of course, that your site is more hazardous than you thought. Lower shear velocity is uh, what makes it more hazardous, and uh, you have to put in all that steel and more. Uh, you know, into every every house. Uh, but uh, in Las Vegas, ten years ago, there was uh, a kind of a revolution, uh, and they were doing um, refraction microtremor surveys uh, at every new house site, and they were um, they were finding, um, you know, uh, on, on average, the uh, the contractors were able to save money and uh, do a better design uh, without overbuilding and. Uh, uh, saving some money for the uh, uh, for the customers, for the uh, uh, the builders, and saving money for the the eventual householders. So uh, uh, you know it's appropriate. To, uh, it can see below the 30 meter depth that's required by the code. Uh, the resolution is isn't terrific, but it's good enough for uh, uh, the code purposes. You don't need a drill hole. You don't need a source. And and here's the the reason why it became so popular. It works best in the noisy urban environment. All right, so um, you know once we had once we had proved that uh, you know commercially and uh, and scientifically uh, ten years ago, uh, the technique has uh, has really taken off. Now, what are the <coughs> the waves that we're actually using? We're using uh, surface waves. Sometimes uh, you'll see them referred to in exploration literature as as ground roll. Okay. Um, these are uh, uh, multiply reflected and refracted shear waves uh, that are propagating in, in low velocity channels. Okay, what we're actually using are Rayleigh waves. And if you remember from uh, a previous lecture, Rayleigh waves are polarized, so they vibrate. Uh, um, they're, they're shear waves. They vibrate uh, um, perpendicularly to the direction of wave propagation. Um, but if the direction of wave propagation is horizontal, then they'll be vibrating uh, up and down. As well as um, as as well as uh, um, uh, in the direction of uh, of uh, uh, wave propagation. Okay, so Rayleigh waves are the target waves. It turns out that in in many seismic recordings, the Rayleigh waves are the strongest and most noticeable waves in these uh, 
in these records. Uh, so on the left here is an example of a, of a raw record. You'll actually take a look at this record uh, when we uh, in, in your refraction lab. And um, the refraction is the first arrival up here. And uh, we were really after the uh, reflections, which are these uh, hyperbolic uh, arrivals that are, that are in here. Uh, but you know, near the source, our, our reflections were obscured by this uh, strong wave train, which is going from upper left to lower right. It's propagating relatively slowly. And uh, in your uh, refraction microtremor lab, in your Remy lab, you'll you'll uh, you know make some some measurements just to see how how slowly. Okay. Now most of the energy in this in this section is. Um, at uh, uh, higher frequencies, I mean, after all, it was supposed to be a high frequency, high resolution reflection refraction survey, and so if we filter out the low frequencies, the lowest frequencies, okay, so we take everything below 14 hertz and we try to get rid of it, all right, which is something that we can do in our in the software that you'll use in your in the labs, all right, we get a record that's in the middle and it's pretty darn similar to uh, what you can see. Um, on uh, on the left in the raw data, okay. So uh, distance from the source is increasing to the right, and uh, time increases down. Those are the axes of the record. Uh, so this is a record section, just like uh, uh, I was describing in the in the previous lecture, okay, where I talk about uh, TX plots, right? So we can draw a TX plot here with um, uh, you know the first arrival, the essentially direct P wave up here. Uh, reflections that are hyperbolic in here. Uh, this particular record doesn't have really obvious refractions, uh, but there are a couple of crossovers, one in there and one in there. They're just uh, hard to see. You have to stand to the side of the screen to uh, uh, to find it. Okay. Uh, there's other S waves in here. Uh, you know, maybe that's an obvious S wave refraction there. A crossover in the uh, S wave first arrival. Um, you know, not not so easy to see. And then uh, this wave train here, um, which is the lowest velocity, um, it's hard to find an air wave in these uh, in these particular records um, because the source was below the surface, so the air wave is not really strong. Uh, it is there, but uh, uh, even in this, uh, you know, an, an air wave should be high frequency, and they should be at exactly 330 meters per second, uh, and it should be kind of uh, along this uh, this wave, but there's no no high frequency energy apparent in here that's at exactly 330 meters a second. Instead, you've kind of got this wave that's coming down at a at a pretty low velocity. I think this is about uh, 250, and then uh, you know halfway down the record, which is about 350 meters away from the source, it's bending over a little bit, okay, and becoming a little bit faster. All right, still pretty low, you know, about uh, 300 uh, meters per second. So it's definitely not a P wave. It's definitely not a, ref a refraction or a reflection. Um, you know, these are uh, the kinds of uh, um, you know these these low frequency waves uh, that uh, are low velocity are easy to identify as surface waves or ground roll, and they are in, in this case they're Rayleigh waves because they're vibrating vertically, and they're being picked up by our vertical sensors. Now, uh, where I really can see them and see what's happening. Is uh, when I take a, uh, um, I filter out everything except the very very lowest frequencies, okay, uh, which the instruments are still sensitive to. The geophones, you know, have a uh, uh, these geophones have a have a predominant uh, or, or uh, uh, resonant frequency of uh, of eight hertz. So uh, down at four hertz, you know, there may be uh, 60 decibels down in sensitivity, but they're still picking up something. Uh, because these waves are these Rayleigh waves are so strong, there's really no problem seeing them. Okay, so here are the 48 channels. Now each one filtered to show us only what's at four hertz and below. All right, and you can see the picture is quite different. Really, the only thing we see here, uh, you, maybe you could pick out the first arrival, and it'd be reasonable for that to be there. The reflections are entirely gone. Um, you know, they'd be in here somewhere. But there's this. Uh, we can still see the Rayleigh wave train, and particularly uh, at the further distances, you can see how it's um, <coughs> it's 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 uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 these parallel wave trains, which are um, 
at that uh, you know moderate uh, 300 meter per second velocity, okay, and then you can still connect it back up to the uh, source at zero distance, zero time, uh, up here by um, um, at, at that lower velocity. But you know, after a certain distance, it's very clear that the uh, the Rayleigh waves are very well organized and very prominent, uh, at least in the you know when once we filter away everything else. And and that uh, you know here's uh, if we follow you know the black if we follow the the peaks of the seismograms or follow the the white you know we follow the troughs of the seismograms or if we follow the um, uh, the the zero uh, crossings which are you know in medium gray <clears throat> it's pretty clear that uh, we're going to get um, a uh, it's pretty clear that that we're going to get a uh, uh, a higher velocity, maybe 300 or 350 meters a second, and that velocity is higher than actually, you know, the kind of packetizing. You can see the 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 wave energy is kind of jumping from one phase down to another. All right, and that's a that's a fact for surface waves. So you know, if we if we follow a phase here at high frequency, we get a pretty low velocity, about 250 meters a second, and if we follow the uh, a phase at at low frequency, at very low frequencies, then we get a uh, a higher velocity, and that's that's very interesting. Um, so uh, uh, service waves show different velocities at different frequencies, uh, but they kind of have to develop and start to to reverberate to uh, uh, to to show that. Okay, and that's why the the service wave train seems to be bending over a little bit. Uh, there's also probably a little bit of uh, Lateral heterogeneity in here that is uh, is affecting that. Okay, so uh, after some distance, we have a service wave that is, uh, you know, it's it's got a third higher velocity at low frequency than it does it at high frequency. Okay, so what's going on here? Remember uh, uh, v equals f lambda, right? Um, the higher the frequency, okay, the shorter the wavelength. Now surface waves are sensitive down to uh, about a wavelength, or uh, you know, really, uh, we, we can we can do pretty well by saying, all right, service waves are sensing velocities down to about a quarter of the wavelength. Okay, so here, this high frequency wave has a very short wavelength, and it's detecting, you know, at above 14 hertz. It's uh, in in these materials in this experiment. It's probably detecting uh, velocity in the upper five meters of ground, whereas this one, you know, at four hertz. Okay, it's got a lot longer wavelength. And uh, you know, a quarter of that wavelength is probably, in this case, uh, uh, I would guess about 30, uh, uh, 30 or forty meters, <clears throat> um, maybe uh, fifty meters. Okay, so um, it's it's detecting uh, much. It's detecting velocities much deeper. All right. Now this wave does uh, average all the velocities from that fifty meter depth up to uh, the surface. You know, just like this one is averaging from. Uh, uh, you know, say five meters depth up to the surface, but uh, um, you know this is uh, this is kind of what we would expect to see. Usually, velocity increases with depth uh, as you go from the the loosest soil down to the uh, uh, to harder rock. Okay, um, you know, older uh, older sediments and uh, uh, more indurated sediments as you go as you go deeper. I mean, any driller knows that. And so, uh, as you go from high frequency to low frequency, you expect velocity to rise. Okay, so we could actually we could actually do an assessment. You know, if I did a whole bunch of filters and then picked the uh, velocity of this wave, okay, um, at each one, I could I could actually get a get a curve of the apparent velocity versus the frequency, and that curve uh, is is something that I can. Uh, that I can model and, and determine the uh, you know how shear velocity actually changes from the surface to uh, to depth. I can get a profile as if I drilled it. Okay, it's a it's a sounding. Um, but that's a that's a lot of trouble. Okay, um, so uh, the the Remy technique um, that uh, that I published uh, twelve years ago. Uh, essentially, does all that filtering and all that velocity picking automatically, okay? And and it gives you the um, um, this uh, uh, profile of uh, of velocities versus uh, frequency uh, 
uh, it just spits that out for you. And uh, all you have to do is interpret it for that velocity versus frequency. So let's go through the, the Remy analysis, all right? Um, OK, so first of all, we got to record some, uh, some microtremor noise data. And, and best in an urban environment. Here's a record from New Hall, Southern California, right next to a very busy road uh, in a suburban neighborhood. And um, uh, so our, our refraction array has got to have at least 12 channels, okay, for proper tracking of the waves at these, uh, you know, and in here we have 48 channels, and it's easy to see the velocities of, of the individual uh, phases, okay? Um, so we got to have at least 12 channels. Um, to meet uh, the code and have um, and have the uh, 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 and have have velocity determined to at least uh, thirty meters depth, which is what the code requires. Uh, you know, you use the same kind of uh, rule of thumb as you do for seismic refraction work, and uh, you got to be three to six times uh, as um, as long, so one hundred to one hundred fifty meters length. Okay. Uh, also, for analysis purposes, you've got to record a record that's at least four seconds long of this of this noise. Typically, we um, we record records that are that are like uh, thirty seconds long or, or longer. So you know, if we're doing size and refraction experiments, and, and you will do some um, in our uh, field area this uh, this semester, you know, we might record only for half a second. Okay, and that's you know, the refractions all arrive uh, well within that time, probably in less than a tenth of a second. Over the hundred meter distances we'll be using, uh, but uh, to record a Remy record, we got to record a lot longer, um, half a minute at least. Okay, um, and here's a reference to the uh, the paper, which you can you can read online or you can get it from the uh, De La Mer Library, uh, no problem. Um, that I published in the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America that describes the the analysis and. In this record here from Newhall, California, you can see that uh, uh, there's a. Let's see, time is. Uh, this is a, a record kind of in a different uh, style. The time increases to the right, and the distance increases down. Okay, and then we have uh, you know depending on what color it is, it's uh, uh, it's got a different particle velocity, either positive or negative. And you can see lots of waves in here, and you can see a lot of the waves are parallel, especially the ones you can see prominently. They're parallel. What's happening here is a, a car is rolling down the street, and it's uh, the tire hits a crack in the road. That's a little impact. That impact radiates Rayleigh waves. Kind of, you kind of get this little chevron here, which is uh, really a, a, a very small, uh, very tight uh, hyperbola. And uh, you know, notice that all the tails of the chevrons, all the sides of the chevrons, kind of line up. Okay, there's that surface wave, and, and we can see the velocity that it's it's uh, is propagating at. So. You know the the Remy technique is not a black box. We're not taking, you know, absolute you know random noise data and and trying to get something out of it. You can really see the the velocities. You know, there should be a relationship between what you could see in the raw record without any processing, without any hocus pocus. Okay, you should be able to to get some velocities in the raw record that you see then in the analysis in the refraction microtremor analysis. Here's some more examples of records and. Again, you can see the the overall pattern of uh, chevroning, which is which is these records are from the same place, and the chevrons are are really uh, uh, you know time again is increasing to the right, and and you can see that the tails of the chevrons are all uh, pretty parallel. Okay, so that's that's again our very strong you know very clear record of what the velocity is. Um, now the you know what we can see the chevrons we're seeing are predominantly at one frequency, um, so uh, you know we're kind of limited in in uh, uh, looking at raw records. We tend to be looking at just one or two frequencies, but um, when we uh, when we do the analysis, uh, um, you can uh, um, uh, that's where you start to get the other bring in the other frequencies. Now I've taken some pairs of traces here, and uh, made it as if you had, um, uh, you know, you were you you were listening to the ground uh, through the geophone, and I sped up the record so that put the, uh, you know, these these um, uh, these waves are you know at about ten hertz, which is uh, fairly sub audio, uh, you know, it's good audio frequency for elephants to talk to each other, but 
uh, doesn't uh, doesn't do much for humans, uh, at least most humans. So um, uh, I've sped it up by uh, uh, a factor of uh, of ten, and uh, you can you can hear that at at uh, at this site. And if you download the materials uh, uh, for this uh, lecture, including the the sounds and the and the animations, uh, you can hear it yourself. Um, there's also podcasts uh, and audio files available at this uh, site, crack.seismo.unr.edu sounds. And you can hear the, the distinct passing of these, uh, you know, this is a vehicle heading down the street, hitting cracks every uh, 10 meters in the, the joints in the pavement. And every time it hits a joint, it radiates Rayleigh waves. And you can hear all that. Okay. There's also a, uh, uh, the, the lower record is an airplane uh, a jet uh, taking off. These records were taken at the corner of Rock and Mill in Reno, which is very close to the airport runway. And um, you, when you hear that uh, rumble as the as the plane is taking off away from you, uh, the jet uh, that uh, that's really uh, uh, inducing Rayleigh waves in the ground as well. So uh, you know these vehicles, uh, city traffic, and uh, and uh, jet uh, uh, passenger jets. Uh, they're uh, they're giving very good uh, uh, Rayleigh waves that are pretty obvious. So here's the analysis then, uh, uh, and the equations I use to do the analysis are are at the bottom. Don't have to be too concerned with those. Uh, uh, the Remy software, the commercial Remy software you'll use uh, in the 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 service wave lab, uh, gives you does all the analysis for you, and it presents you with pictures like this that I call PF plots. Uh, P for uh, slowness, which is just the inverse of velocity, uh, and slowness is increasing uh, down in this in this plot. Okay, and um, and F for frequency. Okay, frequency is increasing to the right. All right. So um, uh, what we see here are areas in purple where there's very little energy. Okay. Um, and then light blue is a little bit of energy, and uh, green and yellow means more energy. You know, red is uh, the real energy peaks. Okay, um, and what we want to do is we want to make some picks. Uh, you know, just like we picked first arrivals uh, in in you know, you'll recognize the software from the refraction lab. You can also make picks of the lower edge of this um, um, of of this curve here that you can see. You know where there's very little energy below it uh, at lower frequencies. You can see the curve really well on the left side of the of the PF plot. Uh, you can see that lower edge really well, and you might be able to track it. Uh, you know, like in the data you collect, you might be able to track it to higher frequencies, um, and that's where there's uh, spatial aliasing coming in. We'll talk more about spatial aliasing later. Um, so you can make some picks even at frequencies where you can't see it very well. Okay. Um, now, what are we looking at here? Uh, slowness increases down. Okay. Um, now, slowness is the inverse of velocity, so velocity increases up. And how do you tell what the velocity is? Okay, looking at the PF plot, uh, you look for the uh, maximum slowness, which will be at the bottom here. And this is 0.01 seconds per meter. The inverse of that is 100 meters per second. So uh, this PF plot it has a 100 meters per second uh, apparent velocity that's down here. You know that's a surface wave apparent velocity, often called called c, okay, uh, or a phase velocity. And then uh, at the top, what's the inverse of zero? Well, it's infinite. That's uh, infinite velocity. And and of course, again, just like the uh, reflections and the and the changes to apparent velocity you get from dip and just the geometry, okay. You know where where is the wave coming from? That's the same reason. You know, there's no rock that has infinite velocity. This just means that the wave arrives at all the receivers at the same time, usually because it's propagating, uh, you know, uh, right across, uh, you know, transversely across the the uh, twelve channels of, of receivers. Okay, so uh, you know, what are the velocities? Well, we got 100 at the bottom. We come halfway up. We double the velocity. That's uh, 200 uh, at the middle there. Come halfway up again. Okay, 400 at three quarters of the way up. You know, at at uh, seven eighths. Right, uh, we're at um, uh, 800. All right, so that's how you can appreciate the velocity. The frequency is a pretty straight scale. Um, you know, here it goes from zero at the left to effectively 25 at the right. All right, so we make these picks along the lower edge, uh, 
and uh, you can see I picked. Uh, I really made three picks at each frequency, um, and they, uh, you know, that's kind of giving me a, a, a view of what the range of possible uh, possible velocities is at each frequency. Like notice at these higher frequencies where, you know, I couldn't quite tell exactly where it was. I thought, well, here's as high as it could be, and then you know, here's my preferred pick uh, in the middle here, but maybe it could really be as low as these, right? So I, I included all of those. That's good information that I use when I, when I then uh, go to the second stage of Remy analysis and, and model it. Okay. Um, so uh, you'll do you'll do a lot of this too. You'll 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 recognize this down to the right curve. Okay, and uh, and you'll pick the lower edge of it. Okay, that's the essence of uh, of Remy interpretation. Um, now, why is the curve down to the right? All right, so. On the left side, we have low frequencies. That means the wavelengths are longer and they're penetrating deeper. Usually, velocities go up as you get as you get deeper, and um, so the uh, uh, we have higher velocities, which is uh, further up on this, uh, you know, towards zero on the slowness scale at low frequencies. Okay, upper left. All right, high velocity, low frequency. Uh, at the uh, at the high frequencies, we have lower velocities. We got short wavelengths. We got you know less depth uh, sensitivity, and so they're looking at the loosest stuff that's right at the surface. So uh, you know we're we're uh, low down on the right side uh, at the at the high frequencies, and that's the curve you want to see. It goes down to the right, okay, and it's very often curved over like this too. Um, and I, you know, I didn't invent the PF analysis. So I really have to give credit to uh, some of my colleagues from uh, 30 years ago who uh, who published it. But I, I was the first one to apply it to um, to microtremor data and uh, this simple refraction noise data uh, from urban uh, you know urban traffic noise. Um, now you know how do you get that? Uh, this is just a slide on how you get that uh, um, wave that. Uh, it, you know, arrives simultaneously. Uh, let's say we're looking down at a map of our geophone array. Wave comes across. Okay, uh, this is actually from an earthquake scenario calculation, but that's that's okay. So we got this uh, uh, service wave that comes across and sweeps through the array, but it doesn't sweep through straight from one end to another. So um, uh, we're going to end up getting a uh, an apparent velocity. You know, an apparent phase velocity, which is higher than the true phase velocity. So that's why we were picking the lower edge here. You know, all these other there's there's lots of energy here at uh, higher velocities than the true phase velocity, and that's because of of the geometry. You know, noise is coming from every direction, and our linear array, our refraction uh, layout, only extends in in one direction. So um, very naturally, the uh, uh, the the energy spreads up. You know, towards the infinite uh, apparent velocity. And this is, you know, these are the equations that control that geometry. Okay. Now you might notice that the um, um, you might notice that the uh, the energy is concentrated, you know, right along the envelope that we'd like to pick. And uh, this is the reason for that. If you if you pick, you know, various proportions of the uh, of the inverse velocity, you see that that you know, right close to the true velocity, that includes an awful lot of the uh, of of the different directions, you know, a high proportion of the different directions, that um, you know, like uh, almost a third of the energy, a more than a quarter of the energy, is coming from you know within uh, uh, you know ninety to hundred percent of the uh, of the true um, uh, uh, slowness, which means it's uh, you know um, it's it's most of the energy is coming in at most you know ten percent uh, high high in apparent velocity. Uh, being the inverse of slowness, so um, that's uh, 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 a, a fact that makes this analysis possible. Um, another thing that uh, uh, you might be wondering about is, um, you know, how how do we get to, um, these low frequency results out of our out of our high frequency geophones? Okay, uh, do we have to get these expensive um, you know, one hertz geophones that uh, cost about a thousand or maybe even five thousand dollars per channel, or can we use our hundred dollars a channel? Um, um, you know, say four and a half hertz or eight hertz geophones. Okay, uh, 
Now, of course, I so I had to try it, and I found out that it worked. And um, uh, basically, uh, you know, by putting the geophones in clusters, uh, so they should all record exactly the same waves. All right. I looked at the coherency of the waves uh, given uh, different preamp gains on the on the recorder that I was using, uh, where you actually do have to set the preamp gain, um, and um, you know, looking at the raw data, I've got pretty good coherency. <clears throat> you know, no matter what the uh, the preamp gain, and at the higher frequencies, you know, I've got uh, pretty good uh, uh, pretty good frequency. Uh, pretty good coherency, you know, above ninety percent, above ninety four percent. But looking at the low frequencies, you know, at only half of the uh, of of the uh, resonant frequency, the eight hertz resonant frequency of these geophones. Okay, if I didn't set the preamp gain up high enough, then the uh, the coherency fell to an unacceptable level, you know, only thirty percent. Um, and so there was a setting on the on the uh, uh, recorder. That allowed me, you know, virtually uh, perfect, you know, ninety-seven point eight percent coherency, um, and uh, so the geophones really are sensitive. Uh, that, you know, that low frequency data is buried in there, uh, and we've had good luck even at, uh, you know, twenty-five percent of the geophone resonant frequency. Okay, now, um, so uh, uh, here's, you know, here's the curve picked in the PF plot. Okay, and it's called a dispersion curve, right? It's a velocity at each frequency or a range of velocities at each frequency. Okay, so we arrange that into another kind of plot, okay, that shows the dispersion curve. Now here, uh, it's like we're flipping the plot around, okay, um, from left to right. So we have uh, velocity is now increasing, um, sort of normally linearly on the uh, vertical axis, but the um, the horizontal axis is the inverse of the horizontal frequency axis that we had before in the PF plot. Okay, so we're plotting in, instead of plotting frequency, we're plotting the inverse of frequency, which is called period, the period of the wave. It's like the wavelength in time. Okay, and um, so what we and, and again, you know, we ought to see uh, from from short periods, we have short wavelengths, high frequency, short wavelengths. And low velocity because uh, of uh, you know very shallow uh, sensitivity. And as we go to larger periods, longer periods, okay, we have longer wavelengths, and we go we have sensitivity down to deeper depths. And so we should see in general see velocity rise as period goes up. So instead of a down to the uh, uh, down to the right um, curve that we pick in the PF plot, uh, just for I don't know this is seismological continuity. Um, we have uh, an up to the right curve that we actually try to uh, to model. So we we produce a model that uh, will make uh, something like this red curve. We just try to fit our uh, you know here in black I have the uh, my favorite uh, uh, my favorite interpretation you know my preferred picks which are in the middle and the white picks are kind of the limits you know so I'm not trying to model those directly um, but. Uh, you know they're they're keeping you know I've got to have my curve within those limits, okay. Even if I can't match the uh, um, the point itself. So here's an example of uh, okay we've got the dispersion curve on the right with its fit curve. Okay, what's the model that produced that curve? And this is uh, another module in the uh, as you'll see in the lab in the in SizeOpt Remy, okay, which uh, is marketed. Uh, uh, and it's been commercially developed by uh, by Optum and my former students uh, Satish Pulmonopoulil and, and Bill Hanges. Okay, so um, they have um, <clears throat> they built the software that allows you to adjust the uh, the velocity versus depth. Right, we got velocity increasing to the right here. We've got depth increasing down. Okay, so this is a velocity profile, uh, uh, the thick red line. And uh, that velocity profile produces this dispersion curve. All right. So uh, uh, basically, in the software, you drag around the uh, um, you drag around the uh, the model. Uh, you change the depths of the uh, of the interfaces. You change the uh, the velocities around the interfaces, and uh, and then you you watch the uh, the model dispersion fit change. And uh, you basically go through a process that I'll teach you uh, 
to uh, to make it fit. Okay, and also determine you know what your uncertainties are, what your how how deep you're really being able to see anything, um, and that's why I know that uh, this particular part of the model here is beyond the depth at which we can we can really tell. Uh, okay, so um, uh, this curve for uh, the Newhall uh, fire station uh, in Southern California, uh, which we've been looking at uh, right through here. Um, it's a it's a decent match, okay, to the uh, the shear wave velocity log, okay. Now this um, this curve is determined over a distance of uh, uh, you know up to 100 meters away from the uh, uh, the borehole where the velocity was logged. So you know this this velocity log is really a, a point sample, right? It's it's very good, very precise. Um, you know, points out every little velocity jog down the hole. But you know, in the alluvium that we have in in New Hall and and here around Reno and in Las Vegas, the um, the velocity is um, is more changeable. Um, and uh, uh, you know, if we if we put another hole just to the uh, you know just a few meters away, we would see a different log. We would not see the same log. So the refraction microtremor result, the Remy result, this uh, red curve that we model, really is a uh, is is kind of an average. It's kind of an area average. Uh, and, and as well as kind of a depth average, as you can see here. Uh, there's also a P wave log. Uh, we did do some refraction work uh, and see that 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 you know basically we could match the logs uh, uh, well enough for the purposes of the uh, um, the purposes of of the building code and determining the the seismic uh, uh, hazard class of this this particular site. 